The Cartoonrific Podcast is sponsored by the Wonderful World of Animation Gallery, home of rare and wonderful fine animation art. Visit their website at www.gallery.com. And for our Cartoonrific listeners, you will receive a special 10% discount off any purchase if you purchase by March 25th, 2024. Just go to www.gallery.com and enter code CARTOON10 for your 10% discount. Once again, this discount is only valid until midnight, March 25th, 2024. Once again, visit www.gallery.com. The Cartoonerific Podcast is now available on Spotify, Google, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Alexa, TuneIn, Podcast Addict, Player FM, Apple Podcasts, and many, many others. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. A new Cartoonerific Podcast is uploaded every Friday. Welcome back to the Cartoonerific podcast. That's classic animated cartoons. My name is Brian Mitchell, and I'm your host. In the weeks ahead, we have some really fun shows coming up. I just want to uh, give you a taste of what you can expect. We're doing a, a show on the Hanna Barbera Studio, early Hanna Barbera cartoons, and we're going to have on the man behind the early Hanna-Barbera cartoon website, Yelp. His name, Don M. Yelp. He will be here to talk about early Hanna-Barbera cartoons like Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, Pixie and Dixie, and Mr. Jinx, and many others. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. We're going to have on uh, uh, Animation Art Expert. We're going to be talking about uh, the world of animation art collecting, how it started, uh, where it went to, where it is now, and and what's up for the future. Um, also, we're going to be talking with the creator of Moobeard the Pirate, or better yet, um, the creator of Mighty Magiswords. That's Kyle A. Carosa. He's a former student of mine, and he went on to surpass anything I taught him. Uh, he's uh, excellent. He's also a uh, music uh, performer, and he does a lot of humorous songs. He has numerous albums out there. He's often featured on the Dr. Demento radio show. So Kyla will be here in the next coming weeks. Um, and, we, and we have other people planned as well. But as we get closer to those shows, we'll talk to you about those. This week, we have two-time Emmy Award-winning writer, animator, director extraordinaire uh, Mike Milo. He'll be on in a few minutes, and uh, it's the first of a two-part interview. So um, as in the previous interview with Matt Bates, we did a three-part interview. May have been too long for some of you, so we're, we're going to go with a two-parter on this one. Uh, and uh, Mike will be talking about his experiences in the uh, getting into the animation realm. So uh, that's coming up in just a few. Let's open up the old cartoonerific mailbag. Well, now, this letter comes from Alan C. of Burbank, California, and Alan writes, I really like the cartoonerific theme song. Can you tell me who wrote it? Thank you, Alan. Well, thank you, Alan. The person who actually wrote that song did not want his name mentioned on the show, but he said, you can put this name on, and it was Anthem Writer, as an Anthem Writer. So uh, if you really want to find out who he is, uh, and he's a 
professional musician, and he has been for years now, you can go to anthemwriter.com. That's A-N-T-H-E-M-W-R-I-T-E-R.com, and you can find out all about him. So thank you, Anthem Writer, uh, for that for the wonderful music for this show. Anyway, up next is a uh, wonderful animator, gifted cartoonist, Michael Milo. He'll be coming up right after this. Don't go away. Cartoonerific is the place to be to celebrate hand-drawn animated cartoons. The Cartoonerific podcast features interviews with the magic makers behind your favorite animated cartoons with episodes uploaded every Friday. Or visit the Cartoonerific blog featuring articles about classic cartoon animation. At the Cartoonerific gallery, view original animation art and memorabilia from your favorite animated films and TV shows. The company store features exclusive swag from the Cartoonerific universe. And coming soon, brand new world premiere cartoons on the Cartoonerific channel. It's all here. Join the fun at www.cartoonerific.com. That's cartoon, E-R-I-F-I-C dot com. It's Cartoonerific, saving the universe one funny cartoon at a time. And now, here's your Cartoonerific host, Brian Mitchell. Why, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. We have a, a real special guest today. Uh, he's worked in the industry for, oh God, probably about 100 years, I guess. He's uh, been nominated nine times as a uh, animator, director, writer, storyboard artist. He's a great guy. Uh, worked with him on a few different shows. We worked on... Uh, Animaniacs and Tiny Toons together and a few others by, uh, uh, we were freelancing on some stuff. want to bring on uh, wonderful guest, Mike Milo. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Hey, what's up? How you doing? I, I think the last time I saw you was, like saw you, was at Warner Brothers back in the 90s, I think. I can't remember, other than maybe like lunch and passing by and, hey, what's up? Yeah, I don't. I don't think we worked in house together in a very long time. In a very long time, yeah. But you've worked with a lot of people that I've worked with, uh, or I've taught actually. Um, I think uh, Peter Browngard actually took a class with me back in really? the nineties. Yeah, he. Uh, uh, so Uncle Grandpa, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and well, uh, and he also did the. HBO Max Looney Tunes. He's executive produced that, which I also worked on. Oh wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. He took a summer class with me in animation <laughs> and, uh, uh, and you know, Kyle Carosa, right? I do. I know Kyle as well. We both did a, uh, we both did pilots for, uh, Nickelodeon, um, back in like 2006, 2007. Right. Um, yeah, that's also the, the pilot where, uh, Adventure Time got picked up. Uh, it, was, right. it was the, the program that it was called Random Cartoons and it was part of, what was originally oh yeah cartoons and there a lot of nickelodeon shows got picked up from that shorts program mm -hmm. and then on the fourth season uh fred seibert who was the guy that you know conceived it he uh decided that oh yeah would be boring to do it again so he rebranded the fourth season let's let's start at the beginning uh, you're you're from new jersey right you don't, you don't sound like you're, uh, you know, one of the people from the Jersey Shore. You got to tell me a little bit about uh, growing up and. Well, yeah, I don't, I, you know, my, my, uh, my mom was from Connecticut. They have a different kind of accent and it's not that Jersey accent. Right. And my, uh, my father is from Jersey. And so my mom taught me to, to speak more or less. And so I don't think I have the full accent that a lot of my friends do. Because, you know, I, I've actually been living in Los Angeles longer now than I lived in Jersey. And I haven't gotten rid of any of it, but, it, you know, the accent. But at the same time, my friends tease me now that I've lost some of it. Right. Which I don't know why you'd be proud of this accent, but it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's what it is. Yeah, I never had the... Uh... You know, I well, I didn't. I didn't think I had a New York accent until I went out to California. I said, "No, you sound like you sound like yeah. you're from New York." Yeah, 
Yeah. No, I'm not really picking it up, actually. You have that nice dulcet tones, kind of cool and even. And I don't know, Jersey seems to yell a lot. Yeah. Being from New Jersey, I would go into the city once I got to be in my 20s and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we'd go out to clubs and stuff. But it was still a long trek just because of the traffic. And so we didn't do it so much. And I certainly didn't eat lunch there, except for when I started uh, my first job in animation, which was at a place called Broadcast Arts back in 1990. And I was doing in betweening on um, the Honey Nut Cheerios commercials and uh, Fruity Pebbles. And uh, we did a Campbell soup commercial and uh, stuff like that. And um, Mm -hmm. that was the first time I ever had sushi. I had never had sushi before that. And there was a little place across the street that I just, and they had like this little salad bar, which was also new back then in the the nineties. And um, they had the California rolls. And I told all my buddies about it that later that night, like I would go there and I'd get it every day for lunch. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, oh, that's disgusting. Why would you eat raw fish? That's gross. Why would you do that? And I'm like, it's not really raw. It's, you know, because it was just California roll. Right. They're like, oh, no, that's disgusting. Don't even talk to me anymore. You know, they didn't know. know, But it was it it was just so good. I also never had Mexican food until I was in my 20s. They just didn't have that back in jersey was that so. when you you went to los angeles you had mexican no food. actually there was a place just like a year before i left they opened up a mexican restaurant and i know by that time me and my buddies were out you know carousing and you know bar hopping and that's where we would always go for dinner and uh it was What's bizarre that to me it, like i i I don't know, you know, like if you never have that invitation or or that opportunity to eat something you don't really think much about Hmm, what else could I eat? I just ate what I ate and I didn't, didn't really think about that. I was also a lot skinnier. I think once the options showed up, I started eating a little too much, but um, I, I think we know, all kind of, yeah, I, I think everybody kind of gets to that point. Yeah. But some people just don't gain weight. And yeah. it's like me, I, you know, I, I look at a Twinkie and forget about it. I gain like 10 pounds. <laughs> oh yeah. But, uh, no, everybody always says, Hey, I lost 10 pounds. And I said, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, because it's ridiculous. But I hear you. Hey, so how did you? Okay, so let's let's get to the the early days. Let's get to so you. Uh, how did you get interested in animation? Uh, was there, you know, when did you get interested in animation? First time I ever got interested in animation was um, probably when I was about four, and. Back in the day, you know, this is the 60s, um, when there was a really big coffee table book, they would send out pamphlets and brochures about the book. And there was this uh, brochure that just came to our house that was The Art of Walt Disney. And, you know, it was a big, thick tome. And uh, it gave, like, examples of stuff inside the book. And one of them was a very early... Uh, model sheet of Mickey Mouse and it was that like I can even remember like later on I learned that uh, I don't know if it's Oba Iwerks or Uba Iwerks but whatever his name was he can't yell at me now can he? No (laughs) no but his family could. (laughs) Yeah I suppose (laughs) well I apologize to all the Iwerks people. I think I think they just called him Ub I think they just called him Ub Iwerks but I think the name probably went on you know. Yeah 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 well all right so anyway Ub um, he used to take a, a coin and he would draw with the coin and like make the circles for the head and the ears and the little belly and everything. But anyway, there was a model sheet. And it was a turnaround front, three quarters, side, back. And then there was a mouth chart of these little mouths that he had put together. Oh, man, I was just fascinated with that. I carried that brochure around for, I don't know, at least a year. And I tried to draw stuff and I couldn't draw at all, but I tried. I even had somewhere a little pad of paper that I was probably about four or five and trying to draw Mickey Mouse. And it looks like crap, but it was it was it was my earliest iteration of being interested. And then I always then I drew from that point on. And when I hit puberty, I decided that that you know drawing wasn't cool. And I like now I liked girls. So I didn't think girls were gonna like that. So I just stopped drawing, really. And uh, 
and I really didn't draw much. I mean, I guess I drew a little bit. I took some art classes in high school and whatnot, but I really didn't draw with the idea like, oh, I can make a job out of this. And I, to be quite honest, I didn't really think about what I was going to do with my life. I kind of, I, I lived day to day more. Yeah, you're, roll, really you're rolling more. along. You're, you're yeah. rolling along to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, uh, so I didn't really think much about it. And, uh, you know, graduated high school, started working at a job. My, my dad was uh, what you'd call an industrial caterer. So his father started a business uh, doing basically commissaries, like high-end commissaries for executive uh, companies and stuff like Hewlett Packard. And uh, um, we had a concession at Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Lipton, uh, ADP, Simon and Schuster. And uh, he ran all that stuff. And so, you know, it, it was a multi-million dollar business when my grandfather had it. Um, slowly but surely, my father really just wasn't a good businessman and he ran it into the ground, but I was supposed to take over for that. Right. And uh, we got in some arguments and fights about that and I quit. And it's a funny story. I, I, uh, I quit on a Tuesday and then I got up, my mother smacked me and told me to take out the trash because the garbage man was coming mm -hmm. and I was supposed to do it last night and I didn't. So I ran outside to go toss out the trash and this little Italian man, I'm not kidding when I say, it, I mean, he was probably about five feet tall with a big bald head and uh, big Popeye arms. And he was just covered from head to toe with, with hair, like a Wookiee. And, and he's, and I'm putting out the trash and he, and he goes, he comes up the, the sidewalk or the, the driveway. And he's like, Hey, what are you doing? Why are you, what, what, why are you a big, strong guy? Why are you not work? And I said, well, I just quit my job yesterday. You come work for me. You come tomorrow. I hear, here's the address. You come work for me. And I'm like, okay. And then, so I went from like table to trash in one day. Wow. <laughs> and I, uh, and I, and then I, then I, I hauled trash for three years and uh, in Jersey and that sucked. Uh, you know, the, the heat and the cold. And I got a million great stories about, hauling trash that I think in some ways led me to love slapstick even more, but, um, <laughs> but, I, but, you know, but it, it was, it, it was fun in some capacities, but I can remember one particular time I'm on the back of the, of the garbage truck. Cause they're not like, I don't know how they still are, you know, back in New York, but you know, the ones out here, they got the little arms and they pick up the thing and they throw it into the hopper in the back. And yeah. the guy never gets out of the truck. Well, it's like a trans Jersey, a giant transformer. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And but back in Jersey, you had to you had to drive the truck, and then you'd get out of the truck, and then you'd run to the houses and pick up four or five houses, come back, throw it into the hopper, move the truck forward a little bit, mm -hmm. and it was so so. I would sit on the back of the truck outside and just hold on to the railings out in the back. And I can remember this one time it's sleeting and it's what, I guess, whatever sleet is, it's about 34 degrees out. Cause I don't, I think 32 it freezes, but mm -hmm. it was not cold enough. And my beard was just covered in ice and, and I'm, you know, squinting. And I, I just think to myself, this sucks. I got to do something else. I got to do something else. And the only thing I could think of that I had a talent for doing was, when I was a kid and I drew and I said, well, I like that. And I did a little bit of it in high school and I was always better than the average person. So mm -hmm. I thought, all right, I'll, I'll try that. And I, uh, my mom helped me find uh, a couple of schools. There was one of school of visual arts mm -hmm. in New York city and that, I, I couldn't afford to go there. I, I went there for one year. Did you? And then I went to, yeah. then I went to, I hightailed it to art students league, but I went to a little bit over a year. I went to a uh, school of visual arts. They had, um, they had some old Terry tune animators working there. Really? Was it cool? I mean, did you learn stuff from them? Uh, I thought it was cool when I originally went in, but, um, you know, the big thing was they didn't really, it wasn't structured correctly. Uh, the big problem yeah. there was, uh, <clears throat> I was going in. I, I want you know. I wanted to work for Disney. Yeah. I wanted to work for Disney, and uh, so 
you know, they kept saying, well, you got to be, you got to be a really good artist and you got to draw really well and you got to know life drawing. And, and, yeah. um, when I went in the animation program was part of the film program. Oh, okay. And, uh, so you had animation classes and then you had, uh, directing and you had editing and you had writing all this stuff and That's no, li- cool. and no life drawing classes, no drawing classes. Oh, and wow. I said this, and, and I went to the head of the, of, uh, school of visual arts at the time. And I, I said, this isn't working for me because I need the drawing class. And they said, well, you know, you could take that as an elective in a couple of years. I said, that doesn't make much sense. No. You know, <laughs> and uh, and so um, the the story. So th- this is all true. Tom Cito went to school of visual arts. Uh, so uh, I knew he was working at Filmation because right. they keep they kept track of these guys, you know. And so I called him at Filmation, and uh, and he he spent about a half an hour on the phone with me, and he said to me, "Go," he said. Get the hell out of there. Go to Art Students League. He said, you'll learn more there in six months than in visual arts for four years. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. that's what I did. I followed his advice. Interesting. Thank, thank you, Tom Cito. Yeah, boy. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I wanted to go there just because, actually, I didn't know any better. It was just a school, and they were supposed to teach animation. But, again, it was expensive, and I, I couldn't really afford to go there. Right. Uh, and so I I found another school down in South Jersey or Central Jersey. It was called the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon and Graphic Art. Oh, there you go. Milt, was Milt Neal still there when you went? Yes, he was there. He was, I mean, I don't know how long he was there before I got there, but, yeah, he was there. And uh, so I enrolled the first year, or I actually enrolled in a night class, and I drove the hour and a half down every Tuesday night to uh, take a class in computer animation of all things, which didn't really exist yet. Right. I mean, let's be honest. But I used this. They had this, um, those old school monitors, you know, with the tubes and everything in it, with the big front and back and yeah. whatnot, the big chassis on the back of it. Yeah, and they weighed but like a thousand a, pounds, you know. Yes. Yeah. But it had a, uh, it had a stylus connected to it. If you can believe that. Right. And so you could draw directly on the screen, which blew my mind because after that moment, I never saw that again until Cintiq showed up. Right. You know, and we started doing digital stuff, which probably wasn't until about 2007, 2006. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty trippy. And so I, I really enjoyed that, even though it really didn't have anything to do with animation, it was drawing and it was, you could do sequential animation if you wanted. And so it was kind of fun. And I enrolled the next fall full time and went there. And it was a three year school. The first year you had to take um, the basics. You, you, it was I had to do comic book stuff and you had one class in animation. Mm-hmm. And I actually didn't know I wanted to get into animation when I went to the school. I just knew that I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to draw. But once I got that class, which Milt Neal taught, um, I realized that, no, I, I wanted to be an animator. And uh, when did so it I, I, when did it hit you? Did you do a test and then you saw the thing in motion and then you were like, well, because yeah, sometimes that's uh, all it takes, you know? Well, t- uh, um, Milt had these tests that you had to take and they were they were kind of a like later on, I found out that everyone was really sick of seeing them in portfolios. But the first one was a bouncing ball. You had to do the bouncing ball. You had to do a flag waving. And then you also had to, then the third test was to uh, in between Pluto running. And once I did that, I was kind of hooked. And, but the, I mean, I I loved Milton. I appreciated what he did. And uh, for those that don't know what he was, he he was, um, he animated on Fantasia and on Bambi and Dumbo and he got an Academy Award for uh, directing and animating on De Fuhrer's face, which was the, um, right. you know, which, which was Daffy, or I'm sorry, Donald Duck pretending he was uh, Hitler. And well, it, won a, it won an Academy Award. Yeah, I think, I think what, uh, he has a dream. 
I think it, and the dream is, uh, yeah. uh, I don't remember or, or no, no, he doesn't become the, he's, uh, he's, uh, one of the cogs in the Nazi machine. You and know what? So, I remember that now that you say that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what's happening is uh, all he's doing is going Heil, 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 right? Throughout the yeah. whole cartoon, and he's on an assembly line assembling bombs. And I remember that. Yeah. Bombs, and he's hitting the tops to see if they're duds. Yeah, that's that's that. right. That's right. And the end of the cartoon is he he wakes up and he goes Heil, you know, because he sees a, a figure and it kind of looks like Hitler. It's in shadow. Yeah. And really, what it is is uh, he turns around and it's the Statue of Liberty out in New York Harbor. Oh, and, that's cool. And so uh, the last line is, I, I'm so glad to be a citizen of the United States of America, something like that. And that's the way the yeah. cartoon ends. But uh, yeah, it was Spike Jones and his orchestra. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so Milt did that stuff. And, and I, I, I appreciated it all. But Milt only wanted you to do what he wanted you to do. And really what he wanted you to do was the in between the film that he was trying to make. <laughs> and he, I mean, he had this film I heard- that he did. I heard that from many other Did you? people. Yeah, he had yeah. this deal with um, with Pele, and uh, you know the the soccer guy or football, depending upon wherever this is heard. Anyway, so he wanted you to in between. He had the, a film he was making with Pele, and he really just wanted people to in between it. And I wasn't really interested in that because I was more interested in Warner Brothers and Milt. At that age, he had to be in his eighties at that point, and. He couldn't tell the difference between Warner Brothers and Disney. He just said, oh, yeah, that's when uh, Disney got flat. And I was like, all right, well, whatever. Anyway, I wanted to make people laugh. And I right. met this guy in, uh, in, in art school, and his name was Harry McLaughlin. And he became my, you know, creative partner up until this day. Right. And uh, we just started trying to make our own films. And, you know, we did. We made a couple of pencil test kind of films with sound effects and we even did music together and cool and it, it was it was a lot of fun um and i i learned a lot i learned more from doing that and my buddy pushing me than milt neil having me in between stuff and uh that kind of just set everything in motion yeah and uh then when i got out of art school i went you know i i got a job at um you know in new york city at broadcast arts and mm-hmm. did those serial commercials. Right. Broadcast arts, basically, they uh, their big thing was what? The Pee Wee, Pee Wee's Playhouse? Pee Wee's Playhouse. No, they also did uh, Slimer from Ghostbusters. They, in fact, when you walked into the building, there was a big Slimer, like a four-foot Slimer hanging from the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And they used to do this thing called the Bud Bowl, which was in between Super Bowls. And they would, they would have, you know, Bud versus Bud Light you know, actually playing football. And like it was a three um, stop motion kind of a thing, you know, like not really top down, but three quarter down. And then they would move the stuff frame by frame and then it would play during the Super Bowl. So that's the kind of things. Oh, and they also did. Um, what was it? There was a was it, there was a movie. I think it was called She's That Girl that Madonna was in. Oh, they do the opening animation for that? Yes. Yeah, they did that. I have a cell from that somewhere. Who who was the key animators on that? Do you know? Because it it actually looked pretty good. I I think it was. I recall uh, it looking good. Yeah. Bob. I don't know. He's a a Simpsons director now. Uh, He has been for decades. Can't think of his last name, but his name was Bob something. And I think he animated a lot of that stuff. Right. But it was before my time. I wasn't I wasn't there. Right. So I'm not sure who did it. But one of the reasons that I had to leave New York City was because I couldn't get enough work in, in, in there, and especially at Broadcast Starts. And I remember asking this guy one day, his name was Mark Baldo, who I he works out here now. He moved as well. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't. He told me, look, I'll be honest with you. He pulled me aside and he said, everybody's afraid of you. <laughs> you you're and, and, and not in a bad way, but like. You're young and you're good at what you do. And so they don't want me to hire you because they don't want to look bad. And I could draw better than most of them, even at that point. Right. And I, and I felt I, I, so I was like, all right, so I'm good at drawing and you won't hire me. How does that make any sense whatsoever? Mm-hmm. And he said, I, he said, I don't know. You kind of got to wait till somebody dies here. And that, that was the death knell for me, literally. And I was like, <laughs> okay, fine. 
and everybody was set in their ways and they, they had their animators and mm-hmm. they had been working there for as long as the place was open. And so I don't know if I was too good as much as that they were set in their ways and they had their guys and they didn't need somebody new coming in because they didn't want to upset the old animators. Yeah. You get, uh, you know, there was some of that, I think at Disney where, you know, uh, Bill Titla, remember Bill Titla, you know who he is, right? Night on Bald Mountain. Yeah. I mean, uh, they had, they had the strike out there and he was kind of siding with some of the strikers and, uh, and, but he loved working at Disney and he felt like he had to leave. He felt like because he, yeah. he, he felt the conflict. There would be some conflict. And uh, yeah. so uh, he came back to New York and he was uh, working at Terry Tunes and Famous Studios. And, and then he decided he wanted to go back. He, he directed all that animation on the uh, Incredible Mr. Limpet movie, which was the Warner Did Brothers he picture. Really? With, yeah. He was, that it, was great. It, Vladimir Titla. And. Wow. Uh, so uh, what ended up happening, he, he wrote them. He wrote to all his pals out there. And uh, the review board decided, well, we're, we're far advanced to, you know, we're, we're far beyond what you were doing back in the day. So, you know, we, 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 you know we're, we're not going to hire you. Wow. That's so, crazy. It, it That's really like a, was. A friend, of mine, a friend of mine was just telling me uh, not too long ago that um, – he had worked on the original Monsters, Inc. as a board artist. And Disney just rebooted it as to like Monster High or something like that. Right. And he did a test for it and they denied him because he didn't, because I don't even know why they did, but he, you know, maybe the test wasn't as good. But I mean, if you work on, on one, it seems like you probably have the chops to work on a second one, especially when we're talking about television animation. Which yes, is vastly different from feature. Yeah, you're not you're not yeah. taking the chances you're taking with like with feature, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and I think I, I in my experience, television boards are far tighter, and certainly now today with um, oh, there you know, there are many there are many layouts. Uh, you, yeah, you know, I was yeah. I, I don't want to say I started that, but I was drawing <laughs> my boards really tight with the backgrounds yeah. and I was actually reducing, I was drawing everything on animation paper. Right. And uh, so I draw the background, I draw the characters and then I figure, well, I'll just cut the characters on yeah, and then yeah. reduce it. And, uh, and they looked at that and they were like, Oh, that's, yeah, that's kind of how we want it now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but it's even gone beyond that. Now you basically a storyboard artist is doing animatics, you know? Yeah. So it's, uh, and yeah, that's really nutty. That to me, that's well, nutty. Yeah, you're, you're timing doing, it, and you're. Yep. These and are all layout, separate. And all the acting, and yeah. When you look at the old uh, Hanna Barbera stuff, and like the old Flintstones, and there's a paragraph of dialogue underneath one pose of Fred going, you know, with his finger up, and he's got his mouth open, and that's that's the whole shot, and there's nothing else there, and you know that they have to act all that stuff out, right? And and now we're just asked to do it all. And it's it, it is definitely a very big difference between uh, back then and today, but um, I you know and, and maybe this makes me a bad person, but I, I I prefer boarding that way. I like the the um, I like the uh, being in more control of the film. I like making the animatic because I I got into the business because I wanted to animate, and then mm-hmm. you can't animate anymore really. Right. Not traditional 2D unless it's a I guess there's some commercials, but most of that's even 3D these days. Right. You know. But Have, like that there's that one Klaus movie from uh Netflix that was yeah. 2D, but it's two it, and a half D. Excellent. It looks great. It was a beautiful film and mm-hmm. it was a decent story as well. Right. And man, there was they had so many milk call hands, if you know what I'm talking about, milk call with his hands. Yeah. Like I, that's how I learned to draw hands was through all of the stuff from the sword and the stone. Oh yeah. You know, and, and uh, that, so, I mean, that alone, I was just geeking out on that. I was just watching all the hands move and whatnot. Sure. But beautiful film, beautiful film. Oh, it's a great film. Have you ever looked at the early Hanna-Barbera, like the, Yogi Bear, you know, there, there's one uh, famous one called Pie Pirates, and uh, Michael. Oh Wa- yeah, yes. You know yes. which one I'm talking about? 
yes, it's, yes. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. Yes. But it is it, it is essentially an animatic. I I mean yeah. it's an animatic with uh, a a couple of you know in between drawings, not a whole lot. Basically, yeah. the character is popping from one drawing to another, and yeah. uh, and cycles. I mean, it uses every trick in the book. But Michael Law, who is a oh, MGM right. guy and uh, did Tom Jury, and he did uh, worked a lot with Tex Avery. Right. Um, this he he laid out that entire cartoon. I think he storyboard. I, I want to say mm, I don't know if he storyboarded it. I know he he laid it out and essentially animated it. Yeah. And uh, and once you lay it out, it's ba- for that cartoon. It's basically it's animated, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's you know a lot of those original ones like Rough and Ready, which was before that. Oh, it's even was, more primitive. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, all it's it's like an animatic, but yeah. it's not even today's animatics. No. But um, yeah, I remember this story because I worked at Hanna Barbera in the mid '90s, and uh, I got to meet Bill and Joe. And I remember there one of the things because I, I got there because I did a I was part of this thing called What a Cartoon, which, right? Uh, which was doing shorts. It was the first shorts program that I can think of. Yeah, Powerpuff Girls came out of that, and Johnny Bravo Lab, and Johnny uh, Bravo, Cow and Chicken, right? A lot of cartoons, a lot of good of stuff. That. Yeah, Star yeah. Tunes did one which I saw, which was a uh, uh, pretty decent. Um, I don't remember the Star Tunes one, but but I mean Star Tunes had beautiful animation anyway. So yeah. Oh yeah, John McClanahan. Yeah, I think he's the. I, I he was the one that it was his film, and he did it through Star Tunes. But I don't remember that actual film. But anyway, I I got there through that, and um, I remember like one of the things you got to spend in a couple hours with uh, Joe Barbera, and I went down to his office, and we were just talking and. It was kind of, he was telling stories and whatnot. I was working on Jetson's movie. Oh, yeah. And uh, his secretary actually led me to the staircase to go up to see Bill. And so uh, she said, would you like to see Joe's office? And he wasn't there. So I was like, yeah, sure. And I walked into the place and it was all dark. Yeah. And he had the banana splits figures, the prototypes on a table in front. Yep, I have. And, I saw those too. Yeah, and I was absolutely—I don't know. It felt like I shouldn't go in there, but you know, it, <laughs> I think I stood there and I looked yeah. at this stuff, and I was like, "Okay," you know. And then I kind of went out because I was just like, I was afraid that I was going to look. You know, I didn't know how far she wanted me to go into the office. Right, you know? right, right. Um, but uh, it, it was interesting. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it was almost no, no. like a like a different world in there. In Joe it Barbera's was a different office. world. It was it was kind of cool and a, and in some ways surreal because like now that I think back on it, it was a trip to go into that place that really started television animation. I didn't really think about it at the time. I was kind of you know so excited to talk about my ideas and you know with a guy that maybe could greenlight them. To be quite honest, I wasn't really thinking about the history of what I was doing at that moment. Right, but. But anyway, to finish the story, I remember him telling me that back when they used to make the, um, you know, when they started doing Tom and Jerry, they would make a Leica reel, which is now an animatic. And I guess they called it Leica because of the machine, the Leica reel machine that they used. And uh, yeah, and either you're going to like it or you're not. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. But anyway, so they would take the reel. They would take the layouts and they would film them before it was animated. And then they would watch it. And he said, everybody was dying laughing because a smack really hurt because Mm -hmm. it was literally the, the before pose, the antic, Mm -hmm. and then the smack. And it was funnier. And he said, then when they actually animated it and watched it again, nobody really laughed as much because it wasn't people laughed, but a, they had already seen the gag. But B, also, everything was softened out. And he said that he wished he could make faster films like that. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what he did with Hanna-Barbera. You know, it, it was just key poses and just tilting heads. And it's more like illustrated radio, which was still pretty awesome because Fred Flintstone was my, well, one of my biggest favorite characters. I really appreciated 
the Flintstones and particularly Top Cat. Like I think Top Cat was, you know, really the top of their game. I like Top Cat. I really liked it as a kid. I haven't really watched it uh, since, but it's I really liked it as a kid. Colors. Yeah, it was, the, it was always set at night, so the the skies were all blue and like dark blue and whatnot. So it felt a little moody. And then you know, then you had Top Cat on top of it, and he was bright yellow, was opposite color, and he just popped beautifully. And it was, and then all the other characters were like different colors as well. And it just really was a beautiful film. And I actually ended up using that uh, color palette in my first short that I ever did for oh, wow. Hanna Barbera, just right. to get a sense of because um, because it, it was all set at night, and I just loved that. And we actually referenced those backgrounds from Top Cat. To what, what was what was the name of the short? It was uh... it was called Blues Gang. B L O O S Gang. It was about these uh, three dogs that get sick of living on the leashes of mankind and they uh, break out at night and they uh, become pirates and they try and harass some cats that chase them and they end up blowing up a, uh, a meat plant and get and surf a meat tidal wave. Wow. It was a, it was a goofy little cartoon, but I, I wrote it while well, I co-wrote it. I storyboarded it. I, animated it i timed it and i voiced it wow so that was like my first this is the first time i ever directed anything and then i got another short called the ignoramuses it was about two southern gentlemen moose that uh get um they the a scientist puts a dart in them and gets puts tracking collars on them and now they think they're his pets and they follow him around and uh bug oh. him oh wow but um but anyway I, that, that was my first foray into directing and from there, I got, uh, I went right to directing on uh, Johnny Quest, the reboot of Johnny Quest there. Very and, cool. Uh, yeah. And that was my first directing job. Was that, uh, how many episodes was that? How many episodes do you do on that? 52. I don't know. I think I did at least 26 of them. Oh, my God. Two directors? Yeah, there was. There was two directors. So the the anything that you see on my resume is mostly uh sheet timing that has to do with um with action because no i'm not the best action guy i can do it but i can do more i think the most actiony things that i've ever done uh there was a show called randy cunningham ninth grade ninja which was on disney channel right. and it was cartoony jonan vasquez is the one that created the designs and everything and uh it was cartoony but actiony so you know perspective mm -hmm. kind of stuff and jumping into the camera and you know so it was more anime kind of style but most of my stuff has been funny cartoon stuff yeah I'm just lucky that i can i'm lucky that i can do more than one thing a lot of people i see in our business tend to just focus on the one thing they're a character designer or your background designer or your props or right. you're a board artist you know and but they just stay with that one discipline and i don't know I got the bug from making my own cartoons when I, you know, in Hanna Barbera, and from that point on, I just wanted to do everything. Yeah. So I'll I, I'll do whatever I can get hired to do. And yeah. And I, it's been good for me just because that um, that ability to diversify my talents has made me in some ways more uh, hireable, and that's a good thing. You know, when because as you know, in this business, it's feast or famine, it's ebb and flow. And sometimes you got four jobs and sometimes you got none. Yeah. And, uh, or you, you, yeah, as you're doing a freelance job and then you're, you're searching for another one. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, and that could be, it used to be that you'd be uh, I, the way the industry used to be back in the early 80s, late 70s, was you'd work for six months and then you'd be out of work for six months. Right, right. And um and then and how you, are you supposed to survive that way? I mean, I guess I don't know yeah. how they did it. I don't know how these guys did it. Unless you're working for Disney or I think yeah. Filmation eventually got, uh, you know, they were working uh, uh, you know around the year. Uh I think on, everything wasn't as expensive back then as well. And living here in Los Angeles is ridiculous. You know, I mean, it, it's just it, I mean, the whole country is skyrocketing as far as, you know, what things cost, but Los Angeles is at a premium. 
yeah. for that kind of thing. And, and, and at the same time, there's a, there's a huge glut of animation because of the, um, the streaming apps. So everybody's doing animation, but the projects are shorter as well. Right. You used to be able to be on a show. You'd run there for at least a year. Yeah. And then they, they stopped that. And I, it, uh, I remember when I was working at Warner Brothers and we were working on Tiny Toon Adventures. Right. And then we had, uh, we did the 65. And then basically, uh, I think there was a little bit of a, a lap. They didn't lay us off. No, they I think didn't lay I, us off. And I think they were afraid because uh, Disney was hiring and everybody had a feature going. And all of a sudden right. animation was getting hot. So yeah. they were so afraid that they're going to lose people that, you know, uh, they, you know, I think we did the spring break vacations, uh, I, uh, the tiny tunes vacation movie, which, yep. uh, uh, how I spent my summer vacation. I, I don't know if that's the right title for it, but you yeah, know what I'm talking about. What and about. then, uh, they did like another 35 episodes of that. And then, uh, and then we, we started development on Animaniacs. Yep. And they kept us on the whole time. Cause I, while you were doing that, I was on Tasmania that whole time. Right. Then they rolled us on and they kept us for at least six months, I want to say, before, you know, before we actually started working. Right. And I, I really appreciated that. And no one does that anymore. No one no. cares. No one they they kick you. I've been I've been laid off on Christmas Eve. Yeah. And I mean literally, like it's the, the Scrooge story. And that's kind of how they are these days. And it's it's kind of pathetic. Yeah. That they that they have so little respect for the monumental talent that they employ that I will find another one. But also I think the other thing is that, you know, back in the eighties and the nineties, what were there? 1500 people in our business here. Yeah. Now there's 6,000. Yeah. So that's a very big difference and you're competing for more people. And then the other problem that's happened is, we went from traditional to digital and not everybody was able to make that leap. And that's made it harder as well for, for people that are getting older, you know, that, that started before the Cintiq showed up and before Photoshop and storyboard pro and, you know, all that, all that stuff happened and well, it makes it even harder to do. And, and then it's more expensive because what a Cintiq is too grand. You got to get a seat of uh, Storyboard Pro. That's a thousand bucks every year. Right. And uh, Photoshop is, you know, or the Adobe Suite is a hundred dollars a month or sixty dollars a month. You know, she. It it used to be you got a pile of paper, you got some pencils and erasers. You buy an animation, animation. Yeah, you buy an animation disc that lasts you for your entire life because yep. they're indestructible. You can throw these yep. things, you know, down a shaft and. Basically, yeah. that'd be fine, you know. If the I glass breaks, one. yeah, you replace the gr the glass. But yeah, yeah, generally, yeah. yeah. No, I, no, it's it's very different. It's a very different business. I think that it's a lot more. There's a lot more potential to be lucrative in the business. I don't know if that's the right way to use that word, but but I mean, there's a, there's a lot more opportunity, a lot more possibilities, and I've always said that one of the great things about animation that I don't think you can say about many industries is that you can literally go from being, you know, a prop designer to run in your own show with just an idea in your head. You yeah. know, if you pitch it to the right person, now you're an executive producer and you're running shows. And I don't think everybody can say that they do. Or maybe music, I guess, if somebody hears you play and now you're on world tours, but I guess anything like that is without a doubt, creativity and I, I you know you can go from rags to riches very quickly yeah it's kind of cool and, and 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 the other way around you know yeah yeah you can if absolutely you, go to because you can you can burn your bridges in an industry uh spe and a creative industry and then nobody wants yeah. to hire you and that's just basically that's yeah. the reality well there's a there's a lot of people that do that but mm -hmm. i mean i think in a lot of ways well those the ones that I can think of deserve it, like John Kay. Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard to come back from that. That's uh... it, well, 
I don't think I'm not. I don't know if you should come back from the things that, that you that those two guys. Well, do. because you're in media, you know, that's the thing. You're, you're producing media. So you're always going to be under screw. If everybody forgave you and brought you back. Yeah. You'd you'd be under intense scrutiny. They'd never put you in a supervisory role again. Probably. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, look, whoa, what happened to Will Smith? I mean, that man had like, you know, uh films all over the city and all kinds of things going on, lost his temper, smacked some, uh, you know, Chris Rock live on camera. And regardless of the intent, regardless of what you know about the backstory, because we don't really know, everybody just speculates. Regardless of what it is, it was in bad taste. And if he recovers, I'll be surprised. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, he's going to cry in his five mansions. But at the same time, that's not why he got into it. He got into it for a love of acting. And now he's kind of locked out of it because of his own actions. It's kind of sad. I, I think, you know, it, if the guy was right in front of you and he said something about your wife, right? And and it's a knee jerk reaction. He had to actually make a decision to get up out of the chair and walk up on stage. And that's why a lot of people thought it was staged. I thought because because he was he was in his seat laughing at the joke, and then it was kind of like saw his wife, and he went, "Uh oh, yeah, Uh, mm, Yeah. uh, mm, I better do something about this." Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, on the way home. Yeah, so, you know, they, they say, you know, count to 10 before you do something. There was more than yeah. 10 there, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. He, he had the decision. He had a chance to change his decision, mm-hmm. and he didn't. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, I, I as an actor, I really always loved uh, Will Smith. I love everything he was in, but uh, it's kind of hard to watch what he's doing right now, and it's sad. And, it, I don't know. It, it, was a, recover. it was a poor decision, and hopefully, you know, I mean, he's apologized for it. I don't know. I don't know. But, but you know, I wish him I wish him the best, I hope. Yeah, uh, yeah me know. too. Definitely. He's yeah. he, great. I enjoyed almost every film he ever made, yeah, including same. King Richard that he just made. Same here. He was good in Aladdin. And I yeah, hate, yeah, and I hate, re- and I hate remakes. I hate, yeah. uh, well, okay, I just hate... Yeah. All the you know, you make a you make an animated film, okay, and it's classic. Yeah, it made a lot of money, yeah. and now you're going back, and we're going to make it into a live action movie, and they didn't change anything. It was basically the same movie, but yeah, with Will was. Smith. Well, except for the story about the genie, and it had and something to do with his family, and he wanted to really go back to his family because he wasn't always a genie. Something he like pissed somebody off and they and they turned him into a genie and put him in there. Right. And he wanted to go back to his family. And then he gets to go back to his family in death, I guess. And it just he was ready to be free, but free in the live action film meant he was dying. Right. Which I thought was crazy. Like, why would you do that? Why did it was just the same thing? Yeah. I remember I I, I pitched an idea to uh Disney about a uh like, well, what happened after a, a, Aladdin? Like, not right after Aladdin, but, I mean, if the genie's thousands of years old, why the hell isn't he here in the modern day? And why couldn't he be friends with modern kids or something like that? Mm-hmm. And um, I pitched that, and uh, they, it, they really liked it, and it was in development. Well, not development, but they were considering it for a couple of months. And we went back and forth. They're like, well, could you do this? Could you do-? Yeah, I can do this. And, and then eventually they canceled it because they announced that they were making the live action version of uh, it, and it revolved around genies. And, right. Yeah, so. uh, th- th- that's that's the way things go sometimes, you know. Do you have any questions or comments about the podcast? Please email Brian at cartoonerific.com. Your email may be featured in one of our future shows. Well, that is just about it for us today. Come back next week for the part two of the Mike Milo interview. It will be interesting and fun all at the same time. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. We're available on many different services, Google, Amazon, Spotify, Apple, many, many more. You can subscribe through your favorite service. 
And if you really like what you hear, please leave a positive review for us. I would really appreciate that. The other thing that I'd really, really appreciate is if you tell a friend about us and uh, you can help us. So uh, there are share buttons on uh, many of these websites that feature our podcast. and You can share it directly to a friend so that they can listen to it. Anyway, we have great, great shows coming up ahead. I'm looking forward to many of them. I know I'm going to learn a lot. I know they're going to be fun to do. Please come back for that. So have a great day. Have an excellent week. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you for tuning in. This has been a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. The Cartoonerific Podcast is copyright 2024 by Cartoonerific Studios Incorporated. All rights reserved.